Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Linda Clausen from Themis. Uh, Themis presents periodic lunchtime webinars, and you can uh, take a look at uh, the current or prior webinars out on our webinar link. Today's slides have already been uh, put out on the webinar link. The recording of this session will be put out there in, oh, I'd say 72 hours. But today we really want to look at the enhanced system period tables. Um, they came out and were introduced in version 10. We'll take a little bit uh, of a look of their evolution. If you follow us on Twitter, you can get announcements of new webinars uh, being posted. We try to put one at least one a month, sometimes two. Once in a while, if it's a really busy month, we may skip a month, but we would try not to. Um, they're little short topics. And uh, during the webinar, if you have questions, please submit them in your uh, question area on the control panel. I will answer those questions as we go along. If we have too many questions within the time period, you can always uh, shoot me questions at my email address, lclawson at themasinc.com. Or if you have questions afterwards, where you want a little clarification or any questions on some of the testing I did, uh, please let me know. The uh, content of the class uh, can be found in various different class uh, courses that we present. Uh, they're listed here in the next date that they're presented. This basically comes from the uh, extended features class, although uh, uh, some of the newer features that were introduced post-GA, version 11, uh, we're just getting into the material now. It's one of the reasons for uh, having webinars like this. Hey, there's something new you need to look at. So we'll look at the evolution of how we got here, uh, why IBM come out with system period temporal tables, uh, their evolution. Uh, version 11 brought, uh, they were introduced in version 10. Uh, version 11 GA had some nice little enhancements for accessing the data. Uh, and post GA, uh, enhancements that was retrofitted into version 11, uh, that was really a version 12 feature that we really did like, um, was added later to version 11 through A parts. Now, traditionally, if we wanted audit trails and we wanted to maintain the prior contents of rows that were modified, we did it one of two ways. Uh, either the application program that wrote the programs had to populate another table, a history table, standalone table, with the old contents of the row and capture uh, information from the operating system that they wanted to put in there. That was very flexible, but a lot of times the re-engineering of those applications uh, took a lot of time. So instead, the other feature, the other way we did it was through triggers. Uh, we would create our event-driven triggers that um, would capture the uh, before contents of an update and who did the update. Uh, it would capture the deletes, content of the deleted row, put it in the history, who performed the delete, etc. Uh, but performance of those triggers, that was a separate package. So the package that performed the operation invoked the package of the trigger, and we have administrative headaches there with the separated objects and, and so on, and trying to remember to rebind or 
the triggers and drop if we wanted to alter the table and recreate the triggers. Um, so there was some administrative headaches with those. So either it was either excessive application maintenance or administrative issues. IBM finally in version 10 come out with temporal tables and the system tape time tables would automatically track the prior contents and put it in a history table automatically. All you had to do is define the history and then link the base table to the history. They also extended the from clause to include system time. So you could specify time or a range of time, period, that you wanted the contents. And you just executed the SQL select from the base table and DB2 would union the rows from the base and the history that fell in that time range. Version 10. But it was missing a few things. Number one, we didn't always want to have to go change the SQL statement. So at GA, version 11 came out. They had added a new spatial register or a set of spatial registers for temporal tables. Um, the one we're going to talk about is the current system time. You could set the register to a time and it would return the rows that were in effect at that time. The content, either from base or history, that was in effect at that time. You could also supply it implicitly through a profile. So you could create a profile and uh, set the spatial register to the timestamp you wanted it to be through the profile. Okay, but and they added the bind option to be sensitive to your system time. So enhancements that came out at GA. Post GA, they added two features that are really made this a full functional audit trail. There is, um, and listed here are the APARs, to enable the use of what we call deterministic generated expression columns. This allows automatic tracking for a full audit trail. They also added through an APAR updates and changes to the load utility to make overrides more granular, to be able to choose which of the generated columns you want to provide during the load and which ones you want generated. So you'd have to remove the ignore fields because that does all of them. I mean, it ignores all of them. Okay, But you can do selective through the override option. Auditing. You can track when the data was modified with the original system period. But now with the non-deterministic, you can track who modified the data, where the data modification came from. And you can also track the operation itself. What was it? Did you do an insert? Did you do an update? Did you do a delete? And please note, these non-deterministic columns, generated columns, are not just for system period temporal tables. You can put them in a normal table to track the information. Now, the first one I want to talk about is the operation. 
I want to know what the operation was. So IBM has uh, added a generated always as data capture operation. When you specify data capture operation, data change operation, sorry about that, you need to provide a one call character call for the operation to go into. Now I called mine opcode. To me that made sense. And if you perform an insert on that row, it will contain an I. If you perform an update against that row, it will contain a U. And if you do a delete, the opcode is D. That doesn't leave the original row in there if you're doing this on the base. You have to specify another specification to have the delete into the history. But I's and U's will show up even if it's not a system period table. In addition, I wanted to know who performed the operation. Whether it's in the base table or the history, I want to know who. So I added a deterministic column. This happens to be the current SQL ID spatial register. So I set up a column called user ID, whatever you want to call it. Varkar 8 generated always as the contents of the spatial register SQL ID whenever the row is processed, modified, inserted, updated, or deleted. I want to know who did it. Now, you cannot have a default value. And it must not be defined as not null. If you're going to be using these special registers or these session variable columns to track who or where the process came from, you need to make sure that the data type is appropriate for whichever special register or session variable you specify. For example, spatial registers you can use. Um, you can use the current SQL ID like I did. The required column data type is a var car greater than or equal to 8. Uh, you can use session user or user, either one. Uh, DB2 assumes you're going to define a column of a var car of up to 128. You could also capture the client work station name or the client application name or the token or the client user ID if you've got separations of securities. Those are all VARCAR 255 max. Session variables. I also like this. Sometimes what I want to capture is what application package, its name, the version of the package, or maybe it, and it may also potentially its schema. As much information or as little information needed for the audit trail you're designing and your auditor's requirements. Any one of those can be used as the uh, deterministic session variable generated call. Now, in my sample, I had an original system time specification. The normal came out in version 10. I had my start for my row begin. It's when the row began. Here's when it ended. Okay. Which will be populated when it goes to the history. And I specify my system time, my start, begin and end. And of course the trans ID that's not quite used yet. We'll look at that. 
We'll take a second look at that when we get to 12. <clears throat> and we also added the who and the what. So I had the when. I just need the who and the what. So I created my base table, my department base table, with the user ID generated as my current SQL ID. The opcode generated as the data change operation and my normal system time specification in my base table. Now, in the history table, I make sure the columns match up. The only difference is I do not specify generated columns in my history. Not allowed. And the history must contain the same number of columns, same sequence, same data type. The only difference will be some of the null characteristic, and you cannot specify the gener generated a generated column in the history. Then we link them together. But there's a little bit of difference now with the linking as well. If you're going to have DB2 track who performed a delete, you have to add an extra row into the history. Because when we delete a row, we want the deleted content in there, in its entirety. But I also want to track who performed the delete. So I need to add the on delete add extra row to be able to track the delete operation itself, to know who did that delete. And it's the only way I can get that information is by adding that extra clause when I alter and add my versioning. <clears throat> now I created my test tables, both my base and my history. I linked them together by adding versioning. Then I performed and did a normal load into my base table. Well, load is theoretically, implicitly, an insert. So when I loaded it, you will notice <clears throat> and DB2 automatically populated the insert opcode for this is when the row went into the table and the timestamp of the load and in who executed the load utility. The auth ID, SQL ID of who loaded the data. Then, of course, it hasn't ended yet. It's still an active row. Then I turn around and I do a modification. I'm going to update the D01 department. Old content is going to go in history. The U version of the row is going to be in the base. I'm going to delete department D21. It is removed from the base. The inserted row is going to be moved to the history, and I'm going to create an extra row to show who did the delete. So I end up with two rows. Then I'm going to insert a row into the base, and it's going to track that insert operation and who did the insert. So when I look at the base by itself, <coughs> I will see the updated content that an update occurred on D01, the update was performed by this SQL ID, and this is the timestamp of the delete, or uh, of the update, I'm sorry. <coughs> you will see the new department. It was inserted, and the timestamp, the insert occurred. So who, when the actual insert occurred. And F22 is now missing. It's out of the base table. <coughs> now, the delete puts two rows in there. And the reason is I need the original content. I need that original inserted row that was inserted at 1,500 hours. But it also, it ended when the row was deleted. 
Now the deleted row will have a timestamp. Start and end that matches the ending timestamp of the row it represents the delete operation for. If I don't have this extra row, I cannot see who did the delete. Now it would have been better if the auth ID I used, and I'll apologize for that, <clears throat> were different auth IDs. Um, <clears throat> it just so happened that I didn't. I'll apologize for that. Would have made it a little simpler. Because this could have been Tony and this could have been David. Tony did the original insert on this date. And then David deleted the row that ended this row Tony had inserted on this timestamp. So who performed? Now, if for some reason my user goes out there and says, select from my base table for a system time that encompasses the contents that are in the base and the history, I will see the contents of the base and the history. So here we're going for a timestamp between from... Um, 1,500 hours, 2011, through 2017, December 2031st, 1,700 hours, which is encompassing all of the contents of both of those tables. And you will see the contents except for the deleted row. The delete doesn't show up because it's just tracking the F22, the last unioned row from the history. Those are pruned out of the result, the deletes operations. They only live in the history. They will not be returned for row content in a query. So I see D01, it's current updated version, and I see the prior D01 from when it was inserted. And I see F22. The deleted row, when it started and when it ended. And I see the non-expired rows. And I see the expired rows in my history table. Okay. So, so in effect, I can see the automatic union takes into consideration for your SQL query processing. Now, the load utility was enhanced. And again, this is usable, getting it more granular control for generated columns. even if it's not for a system period. I can say, hey, I've got generated columns out there and I'm going to select which ones you don't generate and which ones you do. Instead of, and you remove the ignores field GS uh, yes option, I can say, for example, okay, overrides. I want to supply the identity column. But you go ahead and supply the system period and the contents of the non-deterministic. So I want the inserts and who performed the load. But take whatever I'm giving you on the identity call. Or you could specify all of them. It's up to you, separated by commas. So selectively, or hey, take the identity, override the identity only. The rest of them are going to be generated. So it depends on the need. 
in your design and what you're bringing over with that load. So you can unload and load data. Okay. Questions? Any questions? I find this very, very um, helpful in setting up the audit trails. Auditing is becoming a headache nowadays. To be able to have uh, the actual base table operation as well as the insert into the history bound into the same package into a complex access path into those uh, building an IPROC into that automatically. Very helpful. Uh, most of our, our uh, performance metrics show that system period, the uh, single package access path does perform better than separate tr triggers or standalone SQL, tr SQL statements going back and forth to DB2, if I can just have it done in one compound access path, that's usually better. So, and people forget if they they bind a standalone update to a table and explain just the base table update, they forget to explain, okay, now there's the trigger, and I have to uh, figure out the trigger, and we have to add that together. But then we have to also include the CPU of invoking that subtask, that that executing that package of the trigger, okay, and to take all of that overhead. So you need, need true tracing for the throughput to actually see the overhead, the CPU overhead, and so on. Uh, they forget to add all that together when they say, oh, my standalone update performed better without, well, gee. Yeah, it would. You're only taking half the operation, or actually less than that, when you're comparing. We do have prior seminars out there. Uh, you can go out to our homepage and take a look. Uh, check out the prior ones. Follow us on Twitter. Twitter. And don't forget, you can always get a hold of me at lclausenthemasinc.com. And uh, we try to keep IT professionals up to speed. So there's usually uh, a notification that goes out on Twitter about new seminars coming up, uh, new webinars being added, our little lunchtime webinars. So if we can be of any assistance to you, we would really appreciate your feedback. And if you can think of short topics um, that we can develop, these lunchtime webinars on. Feel free to send us a message or an email. And other than that, thank you. I don't seem to have any questions. A lot of comments on. Thank you guys. Um, about the nice, concise, short presentation. So hopefully I'll see you again in the near future. And thank you very much.